Welcome to the Orthodontics and Interview Podcast, where Farouk brings you closer to the experts in orthodontics so we can hear their story and learn from their experiences with your host, Farouk Ahmed. Welcome to this episode of Orthodontics in Interview. It's my absolute pleasure to bring Daniela Storino to this podcast. So, Daniela, to give a background, she is, she is an associate professor at the University of Vienna. She is very much a clinician and has been in private practice for 21 years. She has studied under Professor Sado Sato and also Rudolf Slavicek. She is recognized as an innovator in passive self ligated brackets and mini screws. She's here today to share her thoughts with us today. So, Daniel, welcome to Orthodontics in Interview. Thank you very much, Brooke. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. And what's the weather like in Brazil today? It's actually sunny and hot outside. It's been, it's been terrible for the past two weeks. I don't know why, but this, today's good. Not raining. Fine, but, well, you have my envy from the UK where it's freezing, bitterly cold everywhere you go. And okay. if you can see the sun, if you see the sun, it's pretty much the highlight of the entire winter. So that's, you have my envy. Um, so, Daniela, I wanted to start off asking you about your outlook in orthodontics. And you've got very much an, an occlusal-based medicine approach to it. What led you to have that thought process in your orthodontic management? All right. Um, I was uh, trained at a very prestigious, one of the most prestigious universities at the time in South America. Uh, and uh, well-known for research and publications. But I was very conservative uh, way of being um, trained. I was I started with edgewise and then straight wire, then dabbled in, in, in quite a few different um, uh, techniques as I was, you know, growing in my in my private practice. But the, basically the first 10 years of my life, I did what I was taught without questioning until the patients start coming back and I see relapse after relapse and after relapse. And I'm a bit of a nerd. So, you know, I was going over my notes and going over my books. I have a, an extensive library. I buy, I don't buy purses, I buy books. So... I spent all my money on that and uh, in taking courses and I was going, well, you know, but I did exactly what's written here and exactly what so professor so-and-so told me. And why isn't this working? So that's when I realized that we are individuals. So there is no cookbook. There's no recipe. There's no protocol. I think that's that's one of the worst things they did to our profession is giving, giving so many protocols to to individuals where, you know, every malocclusion is different. They may look the same. But function is done by the TMJs, and we don't even look at them. I didn't look at them for the first 10 years of my practice, right? Mm -hmm. So I was just moving teeth around to where I thought would be the best place for them. And uh, it was not until the second time I had braces on for a that, you know, I had braces when I was young for 10 mm -hmm. years. I'm a class three, a skeletal class three compensated. And then I wanted a nice smile because somebody flattened my smile, you know, with bracket placement. So it was the big boom of uh, small arc. So I got braces for the second time and I had them on for about 28 months. And after I got my braces off for the second time, wow, bang, big, big TMD. I was in a lot of pain, a lot of pain. And uh, I went to some specialists here in Brazil, about four of them, big names. Um, and Brazil is a huge country. So, you know, I even traveled to, the, to one of them. And I, I was, first I was drugged right? They gave me drugs. And then nobody gave me a reason or a cause for my pain. But it wasn't the occlusion. I saw what I was told. It was multifactorial. It was my pain. I had to deal with it because I would never get pain free. That's what I was told. So one gave me drugs. The other one gave me a splint. The second one gave me another splint. And one splint, you know, for nighttime wear. And the pain just, just didn't go away. And uh, so I had to live with the pain for about four years. Until one day, um, I went to Cartagena. I have a very good friend in Cartagena. We teach together and uh, we had a group of students coming from Europe to Colombia. Cartagena is in Colombia. And uh, her father had just passed away the, the day before. She says, can you take over? Can you give three days of course? And I said, of course, you know, go be with your family. I'll be here with them. And this very nice group of orthodontists from Portugal and one orthodontist from Bogota, from, from uh, Colombia, so after three days of speaking from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m., I was exhausted and I was in pain. And I remember we were sitting at the cafe and, you know, out looking the beach and the sunset. And it was beautiful. Everybody's talking and dancing and drinking mojitos. And I'm just sitting there in pain. And, and I, I'll never forget Alejandra, who's the Colombian, looks at me and says, Dani, 
do you have pain? Are you in pain? I said, no, is it that visible? She's like, yes. And I said, yeah. So I told her what happened. She says, uh, are you leaving Sunday? And I said, it was Friday. And I said, yes. She says, could you maybe extend your stay? Come with me to Bogota and uh, leave a week or later so I can diagnose you. Because I'm sure if this is caused by your occlusion, I'll get you pain-free in four minutes. I said, what? She says, yes. Yeah. I'll get you pain-free in four minutes. Muscles wow. react in milliseconds with the central nervous system. And I said, okay, I got to see this. So I did, Brooke. I changed my ticket. And it was the best thing I ever did in my life. So wow. it was my first contact with um, the Vienna um, concept, Okuzo concept, mm-hmm. Professor Slavicek. And not only did she diagnose me, but she got me pain-free in four minutes. So wow. that was amazing. Yes. Wow, that is really impressive. On that note, so if we then looked at the, the bioprogressive technique and perhaps what comes out of Vienna as well, kind of perhaps a tough question though, Daniela, is why do you think it's not that popular? It takes work. You have to bend wires. And, you know, people nowadays want to make plastics and elastics. That's it. They don't want to work. They want to IPR and they want to change. And, and you know what? What is my responsibility if I put the responsibility on the patient none easy money sorry but you know it's easy money so there's like I said there's nothing easy about occlusion it's it's one of the, the most complicated organs in the entire human organism is the masticatory organ there's nothing easy about it and but it's easier because now everything is 3d your assistants can do it for you there's no assistant. If you train them, they can bend a wire for you, but they don't know which torque, where to put it. And, and mm-hmm. still, it's, it's a lot of work. Bioprogressive. Look, he was a genius, Ricketts. But if he were alive, he would have progressed, right? He was mm-hmm. in the 1980s. They were the three R's. Ricketts, Roth, and Rudolf Slavicek. They were studying together, all right? So um, there's a lot of good things about bioprogressive. I think if, you, if I would start nowadays... That would be the way I would go, right? Study bioprogressives from the beginning, not straight wire, not, you know, edgewise, just bioprogressive. But they didn't know how to treat a class three. Ricketts had no idea how a class three developed. So Mm -hmm. there is no perfect technique. But bioprogressive is a lot of work. That's why people don't do it. That's so interesting to have such a such a well-established career. And as time has gone on, you've actually, rather than trying to make things quicker, actually learned to appreciate that it takes longer to get the result. That's such an interesting thing. Um, Daniela, on a different note, what do you think is going to be the next big thing in orthodontics? I don't know what's the next big thing, but I was hoping it would be that we go back and we start looking at what we don't look at, which is function, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that, We'll see this getting worse and worse after COVID. Uh, I do have an office, like I said, it's, it's a very, very full practice. I, I see patients all day long, every day, sometimes Sunday through Sundays, right? Wow. And the pain has gone up, right? Uh, the amount of pain that people suffer. And I love um, the new modality because I don't think that plastics are going to take over braces, you know, brackets. It's just another mm-hmm. modality. Like lingual, you know, now we have aligners, uh, but there is no way you can treat occlusion with aligners. Nothing occludes there. Okay. Mm-hmm. And when you have 1.2 millimeters, that's an interference in occlusion. So that will shift the mandible's position. So there's nothing stable in it. Mm-hmm. You can, you can reprogram muscles, but once you go back to touching teeth and you have the mechanoreceptors, everything changes. So there's nothing stable in, in, in plastics analysis. So I think in the near future, you will see this happening. We're going to, and I'm hoping, I really am. We're going back to why are people having so much pain, right? Is it because of COVID or is it because of plastics and elastics? So, Danielle, changing track, what is your favorite dessert? Oh, definitely tiramisu. Oh, my God. My wife and you would get along. I love it. I love it. <laughs> okay. I have to say it, profiterole also, but tiramisu is my favorite. Um, okay, I've got a question here, Daniel. You don't have to answer it, but I need to ask. I know you're good friends with Mark Withermeer and Mohamed El Muzian. They've both been guests on this podcast. Now, if there's a boat which is sinking, which one are you going to save, Daniela? Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, this is, this is one of the hardest ones because I do love both of them. They're, t- they're different, totally different people. Uh, I do have two arms, so I'd try save them both. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. 
one on each arm and I'm not that good of a swimmer, but, uh, I would definitely, I'd, uh, definitely, but you know what? Mark makes me laugh the hardest. So, um, and he's, he's been my bestie for a long time. So oh, wow. sorry. So, Mo. <laughs> wow. Wow. He's going to be hurt. I'd be so happy to tell him those and that news. That'd be great. Um, what kind of stuff in Sao Paulo, what kind of stuff do you like to do? What's your favorite thing about Sao Paulo? Oh, to be honest, is to travel out of Sao Paulo, is to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but Sao Paulo is just a big metropolis. It's just, you know, full of pol- polluted, full of people. We're 19 million people in the city alone. Uh-huh. I guess one of the best things you can do in Sao Paulo, w- when you can, is, uh, you know, go out and eat. We have all kinds of food, 24 hours, seven days a week. And uh, it's extreme. It's great. The meat is great. The cooking is amazing. And I've been all over the world. Trust me, we have great food here. So I'd say, you know, gastronomy, I go out and and eat. And uh, whenever I can, I get out of Sao Paulo, for sure. Coming back on to orthodontics. So we mentioned briefly about IPR. So what's your opinion on IPR, Daniel? Would you never IPR? Would you always IPR? What's your thoughts? I don't think we need to IPR. I wouldn't IPR. I don't. Okay, I don't. There's so many mechanics you can do. Uh, I do not do extractions. I never extract premolars. And and I know I've been told never to say never, but I can tell you for sure I haven't extracted premolars in over 15 years. And my cases wow. look great. But I do extract every third molar. So I just substitute and okay. with, you know, skeletal anchorage, why do you need to IPR? And if, yeah. you, if you need to IPR is because, you know, that you're not using every mechanics that you can and everything you can get your hands into. So I don't think so. And, and we don't know. You know, this is a, a, it's another modality. Like I said, we don't have 15 years, you know, patients treated with so much IPR. And how good is your control when you IPR? And what about both and discrepancy? I don't see anybody talking about this, but they are PRing the hell out of the patients, right? Yeah, I think it perhaps feeds into that speed, which is now the key aspect of orthodontic treatment, not necessarily the outcome, but how quickly can you get there? Um, it's not about how quick. It's you, We're still treating patients. This is about treating, not cheating. Very true. Um, Daniela, you've had a really interesting career and you've sat with so many different people across the world. Um, who is it that you admire the most in orthodontics? Okay. I will have to say that it's not in or it's in nathology. It's Professor Slavicek. He's mm-hmm. been doing what he does for 47 years. And uh, once I told him, I remember he's 94 now. Okay. He's an amazing brain. Amazing. Uh, I do admire Professor Sato also and Professor John Lin out of Taiwan. Um, but when I, Professor Sato does do what we do with Professor Slavicek. One gave me the tool and the other one gave me the theory, right? The concept. And the tool doesn't work without the concept. So I'd say Professor Slavicek. He's not an orthodontist. He's a prosthodontist, but he's amazing. And he's, he's an anthropologist and everything that we do is so ingrained. It's just really hard to explain. And when I told him, I said, so-and-so is teaching it wrong. He says, Dani, relax this is for very few people the ones that want to learn will come to us he's not worried about convincing anybody that what he does is right but if you have half a brain you have to listen to him for half an hour and you will see he's a genius um daniela on that topic of information and what he's given you what one piece of advice would you, Daniela Storino, give to all orthodontists out there? Oh, you know, don't settle for less. Study. You know, go out there and take courses. There's always something to learn. Even if it is that you're not behind them, you're ahead of them. Take courses. You know, get out of your comfort zone. Don't, this is the best thing that I, you know, that you can do is invest on yourself and knowledge. Nobody can take it away from you. So study. Study and question. Look at your cases. I mean, look at your own. What I do in the office is I take tons of pictures and I ask for all documentation I can possibly get my hands into. And uh, I study my cases. So I learn from my mistakes. I think that's the best way we can learn. And the good orthodontist differs from the bad one is because the bad one just simply doesn't want to see. And the good one sees that he makes a mistake. And guess what? I can correct it because nobody dies of a malocclusion. 
That's fantastic. That's such good advice, Daniela. Um, Daniela, I want to conclude this interview at this point. Thank you so much for giving up your time and letting our listeners find out more about you, your personality, and what's brought you to where you are today. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Next is an outtake from my interview with Daniela Storino. Daniela, you were the first podcast I did. How did that make you feel? Uh, you know what, Farouk? I actually meant to talk to you about that. You, you never asked for my permission to do it. Uh, sorry, I think we've lost it. I, lost, I think we've lost the, the connection there. Sorry about that.